Super excited to bring my guy, Jad. I met Jad at a mastermind and um, honestly, his energy was super electric. And honestly, we, we connected, we, we spent the whole dinner together, just vibing and just talking about real estate, talking about business, talking about life, talking about where he, we both came from. And just, um, he had me just like, so just enthusiastic about what I was doing and where we both were going. And then uh, I wanted to bring him here today with you. Um, so Jad, if you don't mind introducing yourself and just telling people where you're from. Yeah, absolutely. Oliver, thanks for the intro and thanks for having me, man. Uh, I definitely enjoyed our time kind of getting together and, and connecting. That was a, it's a great time. It's always a good time getting around the group. Um, I'm out of the Cleveland area. So, uh, you know, most of my line of work has been real estate, property management, construction, and now in the apartment multifamily space. Um, started off kind of brokering deals and uh, everything has snowballed from there. Um, I didn't necessarily see myself growing up doing what we're doing today, but the way the real estate works, you do one thing and, and you add on every single day and it just snowballs. And so um, it's been a powerful tool, a powerful vehicle for us. Uh, can't, uh, can't imagine myself doing anything else. And so uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm, we're, we're super excited to have you. So, um, when, you, when you're talking about the, the different la la layers of real estate that you're involved in, you said brokering, now multifamily. Um, like, what were your family's thoughts on business and real estate when, the, when you first started getting into this stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. So I, um, I'm an immigrant child. I, I came in, I was 11 at the time. So my parents were, from the day that we, we moved here, they were trying to figure out, you know, what's next. They, moved, they made the move for us, the, the children. And, um, you know, probably one of the, the I'm so grateful for, for that decision. Uh, but from the get go, they were always supportive of us to do something big, to do something different, especially my mom. She's always had that in her to push us to, to grow, develop, um, you know, typical immigrant family. You've got to become a doctor or a lawyer or some sort of like proven path. Right. Um, you got to do the whole eight year degree uh, in, in schooling and, and kind of much more safe and much more uh, uh, tried and true path. And so um, I always dabbled in business when I was growing up, tried a bunch of different businesses. And with time, um, my, my family became more and more supportive of what I was doing. They became more comfortable with this, you know, being in this space of uncertainty because there is no paycheck coming in at the end of the week. It's something that you have to go out and build and create on your own, right? And so um, I think with time, they saw incremental growth and that helped them become more uh, comfortable with it. Um, real estate one day, you know, I had been tried out multiple businesses and then real estate one day caught my eye and I'm like, all right, this is it. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, the light bulb went off. I'm like, this is the one. And then uh, just, you know, never looked back. And, and they saw that. And, and I think having tried a few other ventures before then um, helped. But as, certainly as soon as we got in, the, the, uh, the entire family, the, the friends, everybody that's around was, was a huge support. And actually today, I've got some family members in the office and the company that, that helped me kind of do what we do today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when you say time, like, was, is this a month? Is this a year? Like, how much time did it take before they started believing in the dream and the vision and like, oh, wow, this, this, you're doing it, you know? At, at probably two years. Um, so I was, you know, when you first, my, my path in real estate was on the brokerage side. So I, uh, my uncle's got some properties and I thought it was the coolest concept to sit at home and do nothing all month and get paid. Right. And so at least that's what you think before you start in real estate. Um, and, and I played it totally wrong. I went into the property management space. So I was doing all the work the entire month. Right. Uh, but it, the, 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 the backstory is I started off brokering deals and, and being an agent and I, uh, you know, having grown up and, you know, first moving into the country, moved around many locations in Cleveland. And so I always knew every single neighborhood just, just because we grew up in and we traveled, we, we moved around and we knew kind of what each neighborhood entailed. And so started off as being kind of like a local guide or an expert on the neighborhoods to many out of towners people that are buying turnkey, uh, buying single family homes, helping represent them on, on transactions. And then a year or so later, we started the construction, the management and everything else in between. But when we, 
we first first were getting started that first year it's like okay is real estate really the right path for you or should you go work in, in your field so um, i uh i got my license i was a junior in college at the time and so i'd be in the middle of marketing class i'd be selling houses via email to out-of-towners and um that was that was like the year of uncertainty whether this would be like the long-term piece or not um and um right around graduation time i, I kicked off the construction and management company and, and the, the big picture came about and i i decided okay there's i'm not looking back this is a hundred percent you know the future for me and i think right around that point it was either you know we continue to, to to do this real estate piece or we go get a job in marketing and you know be, be a professional elsewhere um and real estate and the momentum that was building up on the real estate side i'm like there's no way i'd look elsewhere so um i think that's probably the biggest when i say time that's probably when it clicked for everybody around me to, to, to believe in the big picture too yeah no I, I totally get that and when you said like it starts to, to build over time um like, was there like a specific thing? Was it like, oh, you started making this certain money that like kept you in the game? Like what kept you continuing to move down that path? Because a lot of, a lot of us, I mean, me included, like you, you build a half a bridge and then you stop and then you go build a half a bridge and then you stop. But like, it's when you, you finish that bridge and you keep building that bridge where you really start to get the results. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it, um, it was a decision at the time, which it was, a mix of like, what am I doing already? Production, money, what's the opportunity or what's the big picture? And then the, the third piece was the team. And so they all kind of lined up right around that time when I was graduating college. But it was a mix of, you know, I was doing just fine to cover expenses and pay the bills in, in the agency world. The opportunity was knocking to, you know, I'd get clients all the time and say, hey, you know, we've got this property, we've got this management company, we're not too happy with what they're doing. And, you know, it's, it's funny, but tell you about timing right at, during the, the graduation week at the time, this guy calls me up from California, who's still one of my, he's very close friend today and, and a client invests in our apartments. We've, we've been, we've done a lot together. He calls me that same week and he's like, Hey, I just got a roofing quote for like 14, $15,000 on this house in Cleveland. Can you look into it for me? This is before we did construction. We did before we did property management. And I'm like, yeah, hold on, buddy. Like I'm doing up flips. I'm doing roofs for like $5,500. So let me look into this for you. We went in, we looked at the roof. It's a big roof, right? But it was not a $15,000 roof. And so immediately it clicked. Like there's an opportunity here. There's a gap where these guys that are out of towners that are not on the ground, they're, maybe they're getting overcharged. Maybe there's some sort of gap. Maybe there's some sort of problem with the management industry here in Cleveland. And so that's what kicked it off. That's where the big opportunity, that's when the light bulb came on to, to actually like dive into that space. Um, and so that triggered me to get into construction, start subcontracting, start doing project management for a lot of these guys. And they're like, hey, you know, we're happy with the roof. Can you go ahead and just you know, fix the unit and place a tenant there? And so they all kind of started to, they all work together, right? So now today we have a brokerage, a management company, a construction company, they all are symbiotic. They're all servicing one another in a way um and and they they really grew together it was a it was not easy building all those companies at one time certainly uh but they all were growing together and there was so much momentum and so that piece and that opportunity kind of came about right around the time where i was kind of making my decision whether do i go corporate or do i stay in real estate and i'm like yeah there's no way there's there's so much opportunity to be had here yeah. uh, Plus the team was starting to grow. So I, I made my first hires around that time. I'm like, yeah, I can't leave this. This is, this is definitely a, a long-term piece for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's how you got into the business. That's how you, you know, cut your teeth and you got your experience, got your, you know, and, and when I say experience, so we're I'm not talking about a guy who's like 50, 60 years old. I'm talking about a guy who's like 26. So you, you like, you, you got a ton of experience really young and, and, um, and obviously that's why you're where you're at now, you know? Um, but can you walk, walk us through like what you're, what deals you're doing now? Like what, like the gap between like where you, like what you, what got you in the business, but then why you continue to like, look at, look at the bigger opportunity and the bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, we, we, we love passive and, and wealth generating assets. Um, that's what brought me into the business. That's what attracted me to real estate. And that's what I was always 
seeking to find for my clients and investors and people that I was servicing. And so it's almost like my entire circle is obsessed with this concept of, you know, let's build something that's long-term, that could be passive, that could be passed on to someone at some point. Um, but it also brings that time freedom piece and the, the, I don't have to be here every single day, you know, swinging a hammer or doing some sort of physical work. And so um, that's what attracts us to this space in, in the first place. Uh, but it was this natural transition to what we're doing today, which is, you know, we're buying, we're taking down larger apartment complexes, typically 50 units or more. Uh, we have some clients, some investors, some partners, um, and we're essentially taking down a property that is underperforming. Maybe it's been owned by the same person for 15 plus years. You know, maybe it, at the end of the year, it makes say 200 grand and this person is living off of the 200 grand. That's just their, 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 their income is tied to that property. And so over these 15 year, this 15 year period, 200 grand a year is going to live and expenses and their home and cars and vehicles and family, et cetera. This property all of a sudden has, you know, deferred maintenance. It has an older roof. It has it, it, items outside on the exterior that needs addressed. The units are dated. It automatically just, it naturally presents an opportunity to where, you know, we find a market where rents are at a certain level, say, you know, $1,200 a month. But this property is performing at seven, 800 because it's dated. It's got some issues. And unfortunately to the owner, he doesn't have the capital to reinvest because over the 15 years, he hasn't been saving up and putting out some reserves. And so it kind of brings a perfect opportunity for us to take that down and, and do something with it. And then a good exit for the seller, um, kind of perfect win-win situation there. We take it down, improve it, uh, improve the NOI, and then typically exit within a couple of years. So that's kind of what we're doing today. And it all started with, with kind of the, the, brokerage background, management background, and, and the transition to this. Yeah, no, I love that. Now, now we're talking multifamily. Do you mind walking us through your first multifamily deal in it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, my, so my first multifamily deal was here in Cleveland. It was uh, something that I came across on the MLS, on the market. And um, I typically, this was back in 2017, 2018. And how many units was this one? This is a smaller unit. The building is seven units. Uh, this is just purely before we explored kind of growing and going large, right? Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's typical. And a lot of investors will buy the smaller units to get their feet wet, understand how, how the game plays. But then once they get into it, they say, wow, there's a bigger opportunity here. So, oh, absolutely. And, and back then, I didn't see the full picture as to what the power of multifamily, the power of what we're doing today, which is capital, the power of some, going much larger. I was always um, interested in getting into larger complexes, uh, but it, it just, you know, one step at a time, right? Um, so it came out perfectly. But the first one here, I found it on the market, they were asking 300 grand and uh, this is, you know, Cleveland pricing. So at the time, seven units, 300 grand, fairly reasonable for, for where we're at. Um, I kind of ran the numbers on it. I'm you know, like, yeah, this is something I would pay about 215, 216 for. I, uh, I mentioned that briefly to the listing agent. They're like, yeah, that's a bit too low. Uh, that's just, we're not going to really entertain it right now. Two weeks later, I'm still looking. And I'm like, I need to buy a deal. Like, I, I want to get into something here. I go write a full contract. I don't call the agent. I don't talk to him. He has no, no idea what's coming. Read a full contract. I put the numbers in there. I put 216 in the offer price and I send it in. 30 minutes later, he calls back. He's like, listen, I had talked with the sellers. They want to get rid of this. Um, they had the conversations. I told them you're a broker, you know, the market, you know, the values, et cetera. And they agreed to accept your offer with one condition. You just have to close a bit sooner. And so I heard that. I'm like, this is the most exciting news I can get on a, I think it was a Saturday. Uh, and so that was the first deal. That's how I found it. Um, I uh, took it down. We spent a lot of reno renovating the units, uh, but the place is worth well over 300. So we bought it in at 216, uh, and and we still own it. And it's just a solid B grade asset. Um, nice market, nice town, uh, and it's something that I'll probably have, especially with it being in Cleveland. I'll probably keep it under the management portfolio for some time. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's like so, a lot of times, like those deals that are. are the first deals, like they, they almost become like your, your little baby, you know what I mean? It got you in the game. It's like, there's so much excitement around it because when you first bought the thing, there was just probably a lot of nerves, probably, right? 
Like you probably nervous buying the deal? Yeah, yeah. So so think of this. I was like uh, either 22 or 23 at the time. Uh, I All of my savings from real estate from like two, three years of brokerage and construction and all, you know, I had about uh, I don't know, maybe 100 grand saved up at the time between between what I was able to pull after all the expenses. And to buy this thing, I had to put down like 70 grand. I'm like, dude, can I do this? Like, like I have it, but should I do it? Like, am I am I willing to write a seventy thousand dollar check? And as a 22, 23 year old, you know, I just don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, and so um, I, I the afternoon I saw the numbers. I ran them a few times. Like, it's the number that I want. It's the offer that I made. It's it's I already ran the numbers, and I like what it comes out to be. What am I waiting on, right? And so uh, as soon as that happened. I stopped looking back. I'm like, I just want to do more and more of this. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's awesome. So that was so that you had the, the seven unit, right? And then um, now, so how? So what's the duration that you've owned that for? Um, I want to say close to it's a little over three years now. Okay. Have yeah. you done any refinances on that property? I did. I refinanced uh, sometime last year. Uh, we pulled some cash out. I can't recall the exact numbers, but it was like in the threes as far as valuation. We pulled some cash out and then we did a few more local projects. Um, my team here does some flips and some residential properties as well. Um, so we, we do some of that, although very far away from that operation today. I'm, I, I, I'm not involved on the ground. I don't touch property management. Uh, most of my work is nowadays just multifamily capital and some of those larger deals. Yeah. So when you refinance and your tenants pay the, pay the mortgage down, right? Yep, then, absolutely. Did you pay taxes on the, um, the money that you took out when you refinanced it? No, we don't do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? So like, but this is how, like, this is how you, this is literally how you build legacy wealth. Like seven unit, 50 unit, 100 unit, 200 unit, 300 unit, whatever it is. Like you, you go in there, you add value. The, va the values of the property increase, right? And then you're refinancing it, pulling money out. You're now don't have to pay tax on that money. Whereas everybody else is going to a job and working and having to pay, you know, crazy taxes, but you, you got to basically a loan. So you don't pay taxes on a loan. Right. Yeah. And then you're not paying that money back. Your tenants are paying the money back. And then you literally take that money and go make other investments, just like you were doing. That's like, that's the formula. You know, that's the wealth creation formula. Right? That's it. This, yeah. this is the sweetest spot to be in. Every time I'm talking to a new investor that's, you know, taken part of our projects and has never been in real estate, you kind of have to have that education piece to it and tell them a bit more about the space. And um, once we talk about through those steps, they're like, wow, I never knew this was, you know, this powerful. Um, you've got, I mean, imagine this. You've got an opportunity where you're improving the community. You're improving that specific sub-market and that property. You're increasing rent etc so you know financially as a building it's performing better your investors are doing well you're refinancing and taking cash tax-free proceeds at, at the refinance stage you're continuing to own the property and you're having your residents pay for your note your mortgage and your your expenses as well as some cash flow i mean from an investment standpoint there are so many ways of whether it is you know call it generating wealth, whether it is once you're adding value, ways of profit centers in the real estate space, especially in multifamily at that level, that it's just, it's very exciting. There's, there's many ways to skin the cat, but you know, multifamily real estate, as soon as I came across it and you would agree, um, it's just, there, there's no better way to, to, for us to go and try to do this or try to run a large portfolio than kind of what we're doing today in commercial real estate. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I, yeah, I totally agree with all of that because it's, it's, it's just, and you don't have to be a Mark Zuckerberg, you know, you don't have to be create this crazy invention. You don't have to like be this brainiac genius. You just need to have some conviction. Like, and what I mean by conviction, meaning like you're going to keep moving forward, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. You ran the numbers that, that like you were nervous, you were scared, but you kept moving forward, you know, like, and then once you had the conviction, like now you have just have to execute on the plan that you, that you've laid out for, for, for the property. And awesome. um, so you, you were talking about, you know, $300,000 for a seven unit building. And um, this meetup like started and originated in DC. So I got a lot of people from DC <laughs> here. So we're thinking about those numbers, like, dude, 
three hundred thousand dollars for seven units that's like fifty thousand dollars a unit like you can't even touch numbers like that in dc like it's per unit maybe three four five hundred thousand yeah so like and and you were also talking about like inv people investing out of state like then they, they were using your management company and your construction company to mm -hmm. um help coordinate that that um that that real estate development mm -hmm. um what is your what's your opinion on investing out of state do you only invest in cleveland or do you invest out of state as well like how, what's your what's your thoughts on that yeah i'm i'm not a huge fan of beginners investing out of state and i and i had a lot of clients that were trying to do that i'm like that's not a good idea unless you come visit the, the, the town you know we'll drive around we'll hang out for a bit and we'll show you what's around and then you know you have some sort of face-to-face -face contact relationships etc so um getting started first deal like single family to home type investments hiring a third party management company being thousand miles away never setting eyes on your property i'm not a huge fan of that concept on the multifamily side having five years of experience under our belts we're buying nationwide right i'm making offers on stuff that i've never seen before obviously we walk it we, we do our due diligence but before i make the offer i've never maybe never been to that town and i'm doing research very high level because this is a volumes uh, piece at the time, right? You've got to write a hundred some offers before you land one. And so we're doing high level research at first before we dig and dive into all the details. And, you know, there's usually about 90 days before we ever get towards the, you know, we need to bring some capital and close this deal. So we have plenty of time once we find a deal, uh, but I'm all for it today. And because of our five years experience, because the five years feels like there's 20 years compact in those five years because of management, construction, brokerage, et cetera. And what it's allowed us to do is understand at a deeper level. Um, I saw somewhere in the questions here, like KPIs, Dude, at, because we had to build a company from the ground up and because we saw where issues came about, where gaps in the system came about, we kind of know where the issues are based off of KPIs and numbers, right? And so now I'm comfortable buying in Texas, in Florida, in some outside market outside of Ohio without being afraid of what's going on because we know just basically off of tracking some numbers, we know where the gap is. We know where the drop is. We know the conversations to have with those local management companies and what kind, what we need out of them, and what, what they need to do in order for us to turn this deal around. And so I'm all for it once there's experience, once you know there is, there's a track record of some sort locally. Uh, but for somebody who's just starting out first time, I usually say, you know, try to be in your own backyard, try to learn it. You want as much control on the asset as possible and as much, you know, you, you want to have eyes there. And so unless you have, say, a local partner who's experienced, I wouldn't necessarily go out and buy properties nationwide. Um, for somebody- Jad, just to clarify that, you're meaning that if you're, if you're the operator, right? If you're the operator. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. As an like if you're, if you're a passive investor and you're investing with an operator that's experienced, then you're then like, yeah, you can go out of state and stuff. But like, if, if you're trying to operate the deal, Jad's like saying you, you want to be close to home because this thing, you know, can go sideways really quickly. And if you if you don't have a, the type of experience or the know how and the knowledge, like you're going to be um, in, in, in a world of pain, especially if you can't get there quickly. Yep. Yep. Stay close to home when you're first starting out. Once you've got the experience branch out, there's so much opportunity. out. There. But for the first one, maybe starting out local would be good as the operator as a partner with somebody who's already operating in, in different markets who has experience um i'm all for it typically frankly being in dc you're going to have much better opportunities outside of dc from a say cash flow perspective because we can find deals for instance at 50k a door or or other um you know say you know other metrics or other opportunities that are hard to meet or hard to find up in in the dc market yeah no, I, I mean, I, that's exactly what I was looking at here in DC. I'm like, all right, price points are at $500,000 a door. Mm -hmm. I can go and take $500,000 and buy 10 units down in, in Atlanta or 10 units in, in, um, in, in Texas for that same 500,000. Like I'm going to definitely do that instead of investing in one unit here in DC. Right. Yeah. Um, even just from like a multiple sources of income principle, like it makes more sense. There's more stability when you have 10 people paying you versus one person paying you. Right. Um, so we had some more of the questions coming in, um, about what, like, is there any, what specific KPIs do you like to track? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few big ones. Um, you've got leasing. Say, say from an operations standpoint, from a management standpoint, any real estate management, you've got a few major components. Um, but management is almost like five companies in one. It's like you've got a collections company, you've got a leasing company, you've got a maintenance company, you've got a lot of moving parts and pieces. Um, the main figures that we're looking at is how are we doing on collections, first thing. Uh, are we bringing in the numbers that we need to in order to pay our notes and our expenses? Are we moving that number up? Are we increasing the rents over time? And so our correction, collection figures, our leasing figures when it comes to leasing, how are we doing on time on market? More importantly, when it comes to pre-lease or construction, what is our time prior to going to market from the time we go vacant? And so I'm able to control that specific piece. I may, may have slightly less control on the leasing component of how soon I get a unit rented. I'm able to play with the, with the with obviously a nicely renovated unit. The only thing you have to work with is the price point. So you gotta be pretty competitive for, for quick leasing, right? But I'm able to control the, the, uh, the phase right before that, which is the renovation piece, the turnaround piece. How quickly am I turning around? Whether it's days, whether it's weeks, right? So we have targets here on units that are renovated. I wanna see within three days, the unit has been, you know, tenant moved out, we went in, we cleaned, we prepped the floors, everything else has been taken care of. The say, call it lock boxes or access has been set up and then the units on the market within three days. And so whether it's collections, whether it's time prior to the lease dates, let's call it the turnover uh, dates, um, leasing metrics. So how many applications we're bringing in, how many of those applications are converting into leases that tells us how well the property manager is doing as following up with, with the leasing teams. Um, and then on the maintenance side, we're just tracking kind of open work orders, call it, uh, which is essentially, are we behind? Are we on track? Are, is the maintenance team doing well? Um, is there anything that is, you know, when your average days uh, of open tickets essentially grows, that means there's probably one or two tickets that are in there that, are, that have been around for a long time and they shouldn't be, right? And so what is that? Is that a major issue? Is it a plumbing clog that's, you know, not being resolved by our maintenance team? Is it something major that's possibly in the pipes? Do we have to dig for it? And so those metrics, with the experience, once you see those metrics and you see a small shift, you know exactly kind of what's going on, or, or at the very least, you know there's a red flag to pay attention. And the reason why you know what, what's, what it needs, what's going on is because it's like, all of those things go back to accountability. And by Jad understanding those things, he knows whether people are doing their jobs or they're not doing their jobs. And then once he realizes that someone's not doing their job, he can hold someone accountable. And we, you know, and I know, we always get more results when we have someone that's holding us accountable. There's a reason why people get trainers in the gym because they can get, the, the trainer's gonna hold them accountable and they're gonna get the results that they actually signed up to get. So yeah, I totally agree with you. It's, it's all about that holding people, holding the accountability um, for the production. Yeah. So, you, um, you, just to kind of go in a little bit deeper into your, your uh, uh, Cleveland experience, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do any, um, do you do any management in, in the Columbus area and like what size portfolios do you, you normally manage with your yeah. Company? Yeah. I mean, our management company today manages a little over 500 units here in Cleveland. Uh, we're only in the Cleveland market. Um, it's, uh, we have, you know, as you're growing, we have leadership teams that are moving in and out that are transitioning into new opportunities, whether we're bringing somebody on the multifamily side, whether they're doing more residential flips and they're, you know, we're, we're taking advantage of this crazy market right now in the residential space. Uh, but essentially um, we're, we're at a stage in the management company where we have about six months of restructuring for scale. And so it may be that 2022, 2023, we're in different markets. Uh, right now we're only in the Cleveland market and it's been all about building, systematizing, perfecting the system so that we can essentially replicate it in other markets as needed. Um, I'm not looking to I'm not looking to necessarily take this nationwide and manage the properties that we own just yet because there's a lot of administrators, there's a lot of training. We're hiring so many people across many different states. It kind of gets, I'd rather focus on let's do more deals, let's find more great deals, let's make more offers, let's bring more capital together um, and outsource the management piece nationwide. But here locally, 500 doors in that is now becoming a system that could be replicated in different markets to where we're able to scale it much more quickly. Not as quickly as obviously hiring third party, but 
we're able to get into a market and within six months have some sort of solid footing in that market. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, I'd like to get your opinion on Jen's question. She was asking, um, if your immediate market is super expensive, like uh, Northern Virginia, would, mm -hmm. would you suggest going out of, um, out of state to find your first multifamily? I'm going to let you answer and then I, I got an answer for that too. Yeah, I, you know what? I always look at what's the goal, right? And so what is your goal? What are you trying to, what's, what are you trying to get to? Is it cash flow? Is it, uh, is it something like a quick turnaround where you're flipping a property? Because if you're in an expensive market, it might make sense to be a, a home, a residential remodel and flip it, right? Um, if you're looking for cash flow, maybe it doesn't make sense to be in that market because there's low cash flow, cap rates are very compressed. Um, there's not much opportunity to generate lots of cash flow based off of your investment. And so I think the, the, the answer to that is, you know, if your market is overpriced or overvalued, first thing I'm looking at, who am I dealing with? I'm looking for operators. Who can I partner with? And based on their track record, what markets are they in and what kind of numbers are they doing? Um, I would certainly at that point look elsewhere. Um, if you not, if, if you want to be more active, I would kind of join similar to what we're doing here, join groups and communities of people that are in the space that are doing real estate at a high level, kind of start to learn, get experience. Um, and, and then you're able to kind of go out in different markets and, and perform really well. Um, uh, but essentially if your current market is overpriced, I would not mind looking at operators that are working elsewhere that are doing really well, um, and partnering up with that. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, and to add to that, right. I would say like every market is going to be competitive. Right. And like, that's like, that's kind of like the, the reason why, like, you can't just go out there and just get a deal, right? There's going to be a couple different offers right now, but you just have to continue to look at more and more deals, right? Like Jad was saying to find one deal, you got to look at a hundred. So if we break that down over a month, right? That's what's that 25 deals a week, right? That's, and then if you take that over a week, a five day week, that's five deals a day that you're looking at. So like, it's really just about getting the flow of the deals, um, and I don't care what market you're in, like, there's always going to be other players in that market that are looking to buy real estate. That's, they're, they're not making, that's one thing that they're not making more of, you know, they, they, they're, they're struggling making computer chips right now, but like, like you're, they're definitely not making any more real estate that I can guarantee you that, <laughs> you know? So, um, so it's one of those things where it's just, you got to get more deal flow coming towards you and looking at more and more deals. And then you're going to start to see different patterns of the deals. And then there's going to be a deal that's going to come across your desk is like, out of all the hundred deals that I've seen, this is the best one. I'm going to take action on that. So that's how I would, um, that's how I'd answer that. Um, so, um, so with the multifamilies are, can we, can you walk me through like one of one of your bigger deals that you're doing now? Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually we just got this yesterday I just put it out. Uh, 132 unit deal, Texas, Portland, Texas, right on the water. I like uh, Corpus Christi down there and um, it's the Southern part of the, the state. And uh, it's an exciting deal because it's actually one of my bigger ones, but also it's, a, it's a already a nice deal. The location is great. Um, and it's something where we're coming in and we're buying it uh, in the roughly 10 mil all in, um, $15 million valuation at exit. And from a structure standpoint, it's a mix of, there's obviously a local management team on the ground. Um, it's a nationwide management company, uh, but essentially they'll be on the ground, the boots, and, and they'll be there every single day, making sure the metrics are being hit. And, and you know the the leasing and the performance on the ground is, is tackled uh, from a deal structuring standpoint there's partnership side there's the construction renovations piece there's somebody handling the capital piece which is usually kind of what our specialty is uh, there's somebody that found the deal at first and underwrote it and did some due diligence on it um, and so you know in multifamily the, 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 the beautiful thing about these deals is you don't have to do every single piece of the puzzle. You don't have to know every single item or be a specialist in say construction and raising capital and underwriting these deals. You're always able to find, because these are larger deals, there's enough juice in them for multiple operators or multiple investors or multiple people. It could feed many folks that are in the deal that are involved. 
you don't have to be one person running a 132 unit complex, right? And so I think that's one one key piece or one key takeaway that helps a lot of people get started because they think they're. Hey, Jen, I'm going to add something in there from one of our one of our guys from the mastermind, Timmy Bratz. He yeah. always says, "Would you want a hundred percent squeeze of a grape, or mm -hmm. would you want ten percent squeeze from a watermelon?" Yeah. You know, it's like these deals are big enough where you can, a lot of people can make that make what they were they're they're more than what they've ever dreamed of from like a return standpoint you know yeah, and, and the big thing is a lot of people maybe they they look at it and they're like oh this is a ginormous deal i don't know what i would do and i don't know how i could do it all awesome what are you good at are you good at say you know putting together the deal or finding it or underwriting it are you maybe more so your your backgrounds in construction and you can turn this place around in two years and renovate 130 units and make it the most beautiful building in town are you good at bringing the capital together, right? And so, you know, a lot of people, especially getting started, they might think they have to know every single piece of the puzzle in order for them to get started. Not really, like we get calls all the time, hey, I've got this deal, I've never raised money in the past before, can you help me do this? And, you know, be involved on this deal somehow. You've got whatever, asset management experience, you've done this, okay, cool. Um, somebody else might say, hey, we've got the capital, we've got X, Y, Z, we need a construction person. Awesome. Hey, I know this developer that can help you out. And so you don't necessarily have to be the, the kind of jack of all trades, master of none. If you're really good at something, explore opportunities to partner up. And, and maybe that's your way in if you're in a, say, DC market where your, your opportunities are limited to a certain you know, compressed rates. Find other people that are in the space that are doing deals elsewhere and see how you can help them out, whether it's capital, whether it's being an LP for the first time, learning through, you know, by being on the back end, being a silent partner. Maybe it is you're in the construction field and you're really good at that. And you come out, you know, spend a couple of years on a project and you take a nice chunk of the deal and it's, you don't necessarily have to take it all down yourself, but you're in the game. You're you have business partners that know exactly what they're doing, maybe on the asset management side or on the underwriting side. And you know, that, that just taking action on some of those things, just it snowballs, especially in real estate. Everyone is looking to a lot of people that there's a lot of people that come into real estate at the lower level, like as agency, et cetera, you have, you know, an 80% drop rate, but when you're playing in the multifamily space, you're typically dealing with high level operators, smart folks that are sophisticated, that understand the space, that are not thinking one to two years ahead, they're thinking 20 years ahead. And so if you get started on one deal, it might lead to so many more opportunities and partnerships over their track, over their, their career and over yours, simply because you got started in, in, in one opportunity together. Yeah, and you're looking to grow. I mean, like in any situation, it's like those who are looking to grow are gonna be the ones that, continue to grow, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, in any, in any space, like I wanted to get into government contracting. I found a mentor and that mentor helped me get into government contracting. I wanted to get more in the multifamily space after being in like the single family, like smaller multifamily space. I found good partners and I partnered with them. And then I was really good at construction, but you can, best assured that like I was involved in all the meetings and I wasn't, you know, running the meetings, but I was taking in the information, listening and learning. Right. Well, I'm, I'm doing a meetup, right. Talking about multifamily, digging deep with guys like Jad. I'm learning from Jad. I'm not just sitting here like interviewing Jad. I'm learning from him. I'm taking notes. Like I, I'm a student of the game. It's in like the more, the deeper and deeper you go in this stuff, the more of the little nuances you start to figure out. And those nuances are the things that are separate people from making money and the people that get hurt in the game and lose money. Right. So um, I love that, man. And, and that's one trait I see in everybody that's doing well. It's they're they're always, interested in growing they're always looking to grow find out learn more they're curious um they they show up to these events and these sort of meetups even if it's whatever virtual in person it doesn't matter as long as you're there and you have the intent to grow typically that results to something so i, I love obviously i know that that that's you and i love seeing everybody else around that that's kind of um whether it's enjoying or learning gaining something out of this it's all about you mentioned it like I bring on we actually do interviews and podcasts here every single person I brought on has taught me something whether it's like health whether it is wealth whether it's real estate specific if the conversations go deep but but it's essentially picking up small nuggets from every conversation it's picking up getting one percent better every day right getting one percent better from every conversation I was having a talk the other day I was at a cigar lounge with a guy who's he's this hundred million dollar guy 
almost like a, like a mentor to me. Uh, but you know, I get to see him every once in a while. So when I do, I usually two, three hours hanging out with him talking. And the other day he just dropped one piece out of that three hour conversation. One thing that I can implement that would just completely certainly without a doubt improve some parts of the business. And I'm like, like, thank you. Like, that's what I came here for. Um, and so I think, you know, as long as the intent is there to grow and learn and, and I was curious and wanting to pick up on nuances, um, you show up and it happens, right? Yeah. No, I love that. Um, so let's, let's walk through that Corpus Christi deal. And I, and I love the Corpus Christi, the Houston market. Um, we actually, we bought a deal earlier that, um, in, in Houston, in the Houston market this year, it's like 130 mm -hmm. units. And now we're looking at a, a monster deal, a 530 unit deal in Houston, um, a super nice neighborhood. Um, just, just quiet. It's, there's trees. It's like, it's, you know, just a nice community. And I, I'm seeing that a lot in Houston right now. Um, but you, let's walk through that deal you have, right? What's yep. the, what's the total purchase price? Yeah. So there, there's so much opportunity in that market because it's growing. Uh, but essentially, and I'm going to pull this up right off the bat. We're buying this thing for around nine mil. Nine mil. Yep. Um, our, our exit is going to be around 15 and a half. Right. So, and this uh, is, this is 9 million in how many units? 132. 132. So it's like $68,000 a door basically per unit. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly a little bit more with all the costs and all. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so, so coming from Cleveland, I'm like, wow, this is insane. This is expensive. I'm used to buying 35, 40 a door and exiting. Um, but this and I, is, and I'm coming from DC and I'm like, dude, that's so, that's dirt cheap. You can't, in DC, you can't even buy a car for 68 grand. Yep. Absolutely. The, the, the big piece of it is though, this is a market that you exit around 120 a door, right? So we're like, this is absolutely a deal to be had. Um, I'm not used to paying 70K a door. That's not my forte. That's, I'm, you know, most of the markets we were playing in are slightly different. And so, you know, the deal made sense. And so that's it. Actually, it's, it's uh, you know, in the nines, um, the exit's around 15 and a half. There's some renovations, of course. Um, the, uh, the rents are going anywhere from like eight, hundreds to pushing close to 1200s so, so right now you're saying what's the, what's the going in rent right now so these guys are in the 800s right now okay 800 dollars a month in rent yeah. over, yeah. The, over the 132 units correct yeah. um the the turnaround and and our improvements will be around market is closer to 1200 bucks and so there's other operators in that market that are at that rate um our deal is like right on the water essentially it's you can see right then and there it's across the street from the water um it's a nice location it's got so much upside it's just no one has touched it the, the owner has had it for a long time and so you know that's kind of the the metrics are you know we want to be in for say 70 cents on the dollar at most and this deal fits that 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 bracket or those those metrics um, and then the, so the, the big thing there, I want I just want to stop you there though. But the big thing there is, so he was saying that his going in rents are 800 bucks after he does his renovations, construction, adding value, he's going to be getting $1,200. So there's a $400 spread in rent per unit per month. And those who understand how multifamily real estate is valued know that it's just not a one for one ratio. Like you literally take a multiple of 18, 19, 20, whatever the cap rate is right in that area. It could be a multiple of any of that, right? 18, 18, 19, 20 on that $400. And that's per unit of value created. Right? So like, this is why like there's, there's, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars being created with this multifamily real estate because it, it, the way it's, the way it's valued, it's valued like a business, not like a single family property. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, so this is something that like on that interior of each unit, we have to spend about 10 grand in renovations to turn it around. But just roughly speaking, like from a numbers perspective, say we're able to squeeze an additional hundred dollars per unit on rent somewhere across 132 units. That's monthly. That's $13,200 every single month in additional income. Our expenses haven't gone up. Right. Or maybe our management fee has gone up slightly because it's tied to the, you know, it's a percentage of income, but our expenses in general, we still have the same taxes. We still have the same maintenance, but we have an additional hundred dollars per unit on that specific deal that we're bringing in. So just roughly to, to get into the weeds, just talk numbers. If we're adding a hundred dollars per month to, to the total, that's 13,200 
dollars per month across 132 units across the entire year that's 158 grand right $158,000 in this market, which trades at a six and a quarter cap rate, that's $2.5 million in value added because we just added $100 per each unit across the entire unit, across the entire building, across 12 months of ownership. When we go to refinance, the bank's going to say, okay, this deal nets a lot more than it used to. And it's for that reason, based on the new NOI that you created, it's worth a lot more. And so that's the power of adding value and, and, and improving and renovating and kind of uh, stabilizing assets. There's so much upside when, when you find a good opportunity. Yeah, no, I love that, man. I love that. Um, Amanda's like, that's amazing. That asset was way underperforming. So she, she's excited. <laughs> um, uh, what's the whole period on that deal? Yeah, uh, this is a three-year deal, and so we're, we will hold it for 10 plus years. But for us to turn it around and get the rents up about 400 bucks, it's going to be about three years. Um, it's a mix of maybe 18 months to 24 months of renovations to get everything lined up, and then the management team on the ground is going to need another year to get everything up and running to those top rents that we're going after. Um, so within three years, we would have been able to turn that around. We create close to four million bucks in, in equity. Um, and then when we exit or refinance at that three year, uh, th you know, 36 six months in, um, we'll be able to pay out our investment, our capital back. We'll be able to pay some proceeds and then we'll continue to hold it because it's, uh, it's a great market. These units have been renovated, so there's really low maintenance for, for quite some time. And then from there, we just go and look at other opportunities with that same investor group. Say we pulled out our $3 million in cash that we brought together for this deal. Um, we pull that out and we go look at a different deal and, and kind of keep growing while we still own this deal and cash flow and get, get some sort of recurring revenues from it every month. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the legacy wealth formula that Jad was talking about that he executed on the, on the smaller deal. Now he's executing it on bigger deals and he's getting to where he wants to get to faster now, right? Yep. Yep. Like, it's the same formula, but just executed on bigger deals and the, and the returns are bigger, right? It's Absolutely. the exact same formula, right? So, um, Jed, you're talking about like growth and like rent growth and all that stuff. Do you see multifamily as having more like more room to grow? I do. It's market specific, but I do. Um, where we are today, the market's very hot, right? Um, and that's all around. There's so much money being pumped into the system. There is. It, it's like there's some uncertainty around what's what things are going to look like five years from now. Um, some markets, I believe are going to keep growing some rents will never go down because even when there's a downturn affordable or, or middle rate markets and middle rate rents tend to go up because you have foreclosures or people that that are moving out of their homes that still need a place to rent and so um i don't see certain markets going anywhere i, I see them keep to, you know improving and growing um from a like I'll give you Cleveland as an example. Cleveland's been increased, rents have been increasing over, even like through the 08, 2012 period, rents were increasing over time. And it's so affordable, it's got a lot to offer. We're starting to see a lot of out of town, not only investment, but some folks moving in. Um, this is an appreciating market in terms of rents. There's other parts of town though that I'm not necessarily going to touch because they're already at Cleveland price-wise, $2,000, $2,500 a month in rent which is kind of like your luxury high-end A-class type assets. In a downturn, when market's tight, when financials for everyone aren't, you know, like they are today and everybody has cash in their pockets, those top tier markets and those more expensive sub-markets or the more, more expensive, you know, whether it's communities or buildings, those might take a hit. Those are on the top tier, the higher, more expensive, you know, part of the chain, those renters might move down into the twelve, thirteen hundred dollar a month rental, but you know everybody else on the in the rental side, I don't see anything going you know downwards. I typically see rents consistently going up, um, un unless you're in that very high price point bracket where it's possible that a downturn can hurt you. Right, and it goes back to the basics with real estate. It's like supply and demand. You know, when you got a lot of employers moving to your state, um, and you got a lot of people moving to your state. And then the coronavirus happens and then all construction stops or, you know, projects get put on hold. 
It's supply and demand. You now have a ton of demand because people are moving there and you have a limited supply. And it's, you, you don't, with real estate and construction, you don't just say, w wave your magic wand and say like, abracadabra, 500 units right there. Like, no, that process takes, you know, a year, two years, three years, just to even get through permitting. And then you got another year, two years of construction. Yeah. So it's, it's a five year horizon for the, for these projects to actually get done. So it doesn't happen overnight where it's like, all of a sudden we need more units. Boom. Like, no, like, Supply and demand, there's low supply, high demand, like prices are gonna continue to rise yeah. um, with that stuff. So um, where are you headed next? Like what, what are the, what, like where, where do you see the big vision for your company? I mean, you're already doing amazing things, but I, I'm, and I'm super excited to just kind of be plugged into you and just kind of under, like see, see where you're going, man. I appreciate you, man. And, and likewise, I, you know, I'm looking forward to actually connecting very soon here down in, in Charleston, but. Um, you know, for us going forward, it's the picture, it's all crystal clear. It's certainly, you know, multifamily, real estate, commercial value add and kind of buying right, buying at the right prices. Like we just talked about $15 million deal, buying it for about 9 million bucks, right? Being right on the purchases and then continuing to grow on that side. So uh, we're looking to grow the fund, grow the investment side of the, the business much more and kind of more relationships with investors, more growth, so that we're, t we're able to tackle more and more deals over time. And so um, where I see us going, I'd like to get to the, you know, 13,000 doors that, that has a metric to it that, that we track here um, under management. And um, that, that would be pretty exciting. From there, who knows, man? I mean, there's, there's so much opportunity out there. There's, there's so much room to grow. And um, as long as we're doing what we keep doing and buying right, um, I see that as, as definitely something attainable. Um, so that's, that's the goal. No, I love that. And it's, and it's big, you know, it's not small. And like when you're, when you're around big thinkers, man, it's like the, the ideas just multiply. Cause you're, you're saying 13,000 and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I want to get to five. So now my numbers already, you know, I'm already getting, I'm already increasing my numbers. So, um, so, um, real quick, each other up, man. yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, that's the, that's the cool thing of the mastermind and the, and, the, and coming together and sharing each other's thoughts because, you know, my idea could be like, I want to get to this, but then I hear somebody else and then I start spending time with it. I'm like, and there's no offense, but I'm just like, oh, I'm just like that person. There's, there's nothing different. Like I, I can create just like that person can create. So then my dream gets bigger because mm -hmm. I didn't just dream that original dream. I just thought that's all I could, could produce. But yeah. when I'm seeing somebody else produce something more than what I'm doing and they're just, they're no different than me. They just have better skills. What do I do? I now need to just go sharpen my skills, right? So I can now create that result that that other person's creating. That's it. Uh, so Oliver, you, you look, sorry, one, one thing on that note, you look at my goals five years ago when I first getting started, own 20 units or own 100 units. And then now we're talking about owning 13,000 units, right? So the think tank grows, but it's that incremental showing up every day, growing a little bit, and then surrounding myself with people like you and people that are doing big deals. And it's like, opportunities are endless and so it, it all snowballs when you get around people that are doing deals and, and, and kind of influence you to, to do more yeah so that was big picture I want to zoom back in real quick like what's what's your number one hack for getting like deal flow I mean yeah yeah so so here's the thing um, it's a couple couple pieces to to what I do um, I'm heavy on the capital side we're, we're growing the fund we're, we're kind of expanding there um, we are all of a sudden getting deals passed along to us to, to partake in because we're able to bring in, you know, a valuable piece of the equation. Um, but here's what everybody has done. And, and so, so if we hear internally and what it's resulted, I know guys that went 12, 13, 14, 15 months without having a single deal under their belt and they were working at it every single day. Um, and they were doing a lot of broker relationships. They were cold calling brokers. They were making offers. They were doing all the right things. It's just never really panned out. So it, it, developing consistent deal flow does take some time. But there's really, there, there's really one bottom piece to it. And there's a couple of sources that I like. The, the main piece is you got to get to sellers, right? You got to find a deal. There's a seller there and they have a deal that they want to sell and you're going to make an offer on it. So that's the core that is as simple as you can. So like, what would your, what would be your number one hack to get to sellers? 
Um, I would find the top brokers and get in their kind of in their space and be in front of them. And I, or I would find the top wholesalers, cold callers, deal finders that'll bring you deals. I wouldn't necessarily Why would you do that. Them, Why so. would you do that? Um, so for me specifically, you know, between whatever five, six, however many companies are here on the ground with capital investments, it works for me because I'm not trying to, to be the one on the ground, on the phone, dialing and calling and talking to everybody directly every single day. Uh, so that's what works for me. For others, though, there's, you know, depending on where you're at, some, someone love me, like I have buddies actually in D.C., love finding deals. All they do every single day is cold call find sellers, talk to them and build relationships with them. And like a year later, the seller calls back and like, Hey, I'm ready to sell. And so you got to get to the seller somehow, whether it's cold calling directly, whether it's pulling lists and sending, you know, some sort of marketing piece to them, whether it is through the brokerage relationships by becoming like an, a recognized buyer in their, in their, in their, you know, book of buyers standing out somehow. Um, essentially you have to prove that you're the one that can close. And so whether it is, to the brokerages that are, that are out there that are doing deals, whether it is you're cold calling a seller, because you know, sellers are also getting multiple, multiple people calling them. So kind of building yourself up, maybe partnering with others that have some sort of name or, or big portfolio that you can leverage and say, hey, this is my partner and we're looking to go in and do this deal together. It just kind of builds the credibility up if it's your first deal um, and, and it helps you get in the door whether it's brokers, whether it's direct to seller, whether it's somebody else who's trying to wholesale a deal that you're like, Hey, this is, this is the one. Yeah. So when you were when talking about like reaching out to the um, brokers and, and, or if you want to take more of an an energy and effort, you can reach out to sellers directly. Mm -hmm. The reason why you said brokers and wholesalers is because you can make one relationship and then that person has hundreds of relationships. Absolutely. So it's trying to get leverage, right? Um, and, and that's that, that those broker relationships and those wholesaler relationships give you leverage. Whereas if you're reaching out to a seller, that's a one-to-one, you know, leverage situation. Whereas you're reaching out to a broker or a wholesaler and they're reaching out to hundreds of, of, of sellers. Now you make one relationship, you can get access to hundreds of hundreds of people. So awesome. leverage of that, man. So with, with that, you know, I, I really had an amazing time with you. And I love, uh, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, I love speaking with you and like love digging deep with you because you're just such a big thinker. And at a young age too, you're like, you're 26 years old, you know, so you're, you're doing big things. And I love, I love the energy that you, you bring, to, bring to every situation, man. So um, can you let people know how to get in touch with you and how to, how, how to get, how to reach you and how to find you? Absolutely, man. Well, I, I got to tell you, I love having these chats. So, so thanks for having me. And I appreciate you guys. Appreciate everybody that's in here. Um, on, our sen- on, on our side, you know, just connect with me. I'm always around. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I'm on, uh, we're on online at b2bcapital.com. Shoot me an email, jad at b2bcapital.com. That's J-A-D at B, the number two, bcapital.com. Um, happy to chat uh, on Facebook. And so, you know, always around. I, I love having these conversations. There's so much passion to kind of, whether it's helping, whether it's doing more deals, whether it is encouraging somebody to actually do their first deal. Uh, I'm all, that's what, that's what it's all about. So I love that. Thanks for, uh, you know, Oliver, thanks for, for the chat and thanks for having me. And, um, you know, I look forward to maybe continuing the conversation another time. Yeah, man. I love you, man. And um, I'll, I'll, I hope you have an amazing time down in um, Charleston this upcoming week and um, everybody else. I love you guys. Um, Obviously, every Saturday, uh, Saturday once a month, I love just coming here, connecting. Um, and uh, to any fathers out there, happy Father's Day! I, I'm super excited for this. This is my uh, this is my second Father's Day, but real the real first Father's Day that like Lily's um, at an age where she can actually like give me a hug. So I'm looking forward to getting some Lily hugs from my daughter. Um, and actually, uh, my wife is at a bachelorette party for my sister this weekend. So. It's going to be a lot of one-on-one time with me and the daughter. So uh, I'm super excited about that. Amazing, man. I hope you enjoy it. Again, I appreciate you having me here. This is incredible that, you know, it, and I, I look forward to kind of seeing you some here pretty soon, but enjoy your weekend, enjoy your fa- Father's Day and spend some time with Lily and, you know, look forward uh, to reconnecting soon. All right. Love you, brother. Have a good one. Peace. Take care, guys. See you. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click subscribe down below and give me a thumbs up. You can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook at Oliver Fernandez 
Three, I have new videos just like this one dropping every week. So drop a comment down below and let me know what you wanna hear next. Until then, keep growing and keep learning. Just do it.